Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, let's just take a look inside the conference hall where we'll be hearing from the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, probably in the next five minutes or so. Let's see how packed it is. I think every seat is being taken, not unexpected, uh, before the Shadow Chancellor takes to his feet. This will be his first major conference speech and everybody is waiting with bated breath to hear what he's going to have to say, although he said it may be boring, it may disappoint uh, people. Um, what about you, John McDonnell? What are you expecting him to say? Uh, I'm expecting to get the, the what's by now uh, standard practice, the Corbyn McDonnell um, fudge uh, for people who got elected by saying that we didn't speak clearly enough and radically enough. They're now massively committed to the review as a solution to things. But essentially what you'll see is uh, the nose of a set of policies which are really about higher taxes. That's all it's about, higher taxes for most people but in various forms. Is that going to disappoint a lot of people in the audience who gathered in Brighton expecting to hear, if you like, a much more radical vision from this new leadership because to some extent that's what they were promised in the campaign? I think that, I mean, I think yes. I think you, it, it turns out that the new politics are like the old politics, uh, but just done less well. So, well, have we got a difficult issue? Kick it into the long grass and have a review of it. Um, is something a bit unpopular? Let's just say it's an idea we're floating. Um, but the truth is, when you look at, when you look at this stuff, it's very hard to operationalise the economic policies that uh, Jeremy Corbyn came up with, because either they're not practical, they're completely impractical, like the Robin Hood tax, which is crazy, or um, they've got an impact. You know, if you raise tax on on business. Uh, that is paid either by a customer in higher prices, a worker in lower wages, or a shareholder in lower dividends. Those are those are real people who get really affected if uh, if if taxes are raised on business. There's no such thing as a free tax. But what about the practical mm. side of how Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell operate in the Labour leadership? Yeah. On the one hand, you've got all these thousands of people who have supported them and are expecting one thing on issues like the economy, on Trident. And then you've got the parliamentary party operating, some of them within the shadow, mm. shadow cabinet, wanting something quite different. I mean, we heard Hilary Benn there mm. trying to explain how everyone is going to be allowed their own point of view on an issue like airstrikes or action against Syria. How sustainable is that? I don't think it's sustainable. It's, um, it's a kind of pick and mix attitude towards policy and government. And I mean, pick and mix didn't do that much for Woolworths, they're gone. It's a very old-fashioned notion that you can say what you like, say what you think uh, when you're in the leadership. What would the Labour Party be saying if the Tory party took the same attitude towards what the Cabinet viewed uh, should be done in Syria? In the end, you have to have collective discipline. So and one of the things that Corbyn's clearly preparing for is is preparing next year to, br to, to vote against conference policy on Trident because mm. he's against it. But... He wouldn't. He would be the first leader uh, in history to rebel against his own leadership, um, but he'd be acting in, in line with his own behaviour in the past. He'd broken the whip 500 times before he was leader. There's no doubt uh, he won't mind breaking the whip when he is leader. Right, but is there a way of changing that policy? I mean, are they going to wait until policy on key issues like Trident? Mm. I mean, it doesn't sh doesn't seem to be any indication that it will be changed um, before they take a vote, because otherwise, as you yeah. say, he will be against his own party's policy. His own conference this. policy, which he says conference is so supreme. I, th I think the, I think I think you've got onto a really important point there. Um, if people who have joined the shadow cabinet, like Hillary Benn. Um, think that this is the end of their humiliation, they're wrong, it's the beginning of it. Watching a decent, honest, intelligent man like Hillary trying to explain the inexplicable, how you can hold a host of different views on Syria and be in a shadow cabinet, well, it's just not coherent. And he's, he struggled manfully, but he didn't do it very well. The problem is, in the end, McDonnell and Corbyn and their people are revolutionaries. What do revolutionaries want to do? They want to execute the ancien regime but they realize they can't do that at the moment no so you, so you wait and you do it, you wait and do it when you have the chance to do it so the fact they've backed off on trident now doesn't mean that jeremy corbyn has changed his mind the fact that they're going to they're going to back off now about precisely how high national insurance will be raised and how, how many uh, head teachers and doctors 
and senior nurses that will hit. That's not because they've given up on high taxation. It's because they, they're waiting until they're stronger. They'll want to have more of their own delegates next year. They'll want to try and get Len McCluskey to change Unite policy, even though Unite build the boats and Unite maintain the, the, well, the Trident missiles. Let's just go into the conference because we can see Jeremy Corbyn there and John McDonnell helping this lady, I think, off the stage just before John McDonnell makes his speech as Shadow Chancellor. Uh, there's Mr Corbyn thank, taking his seat you, next to his uh, Shadow oh, Chancellor. Please. There will no doubt be a few pieces of procedure to go before mm. John McDonnell gets to his feet and and addresses this conference, and there will no doubt be a warm welcome uh, for the, mm. the Labour leadership. When do you think, John McTurlin, is that there is going to be, you seem to think, a big bust up between shadow cabinet and, uh, and leadership? I, I'd say to you, the longer it goes on without that, the more embedded uh, the leadership becomes. Oh, look, I think that, you know, from a pure Machiavellian point of view, um, the constituency parties and the right should have forced a vote on Trident today, because then we've definitely had conference policy voting in favour of Trident. The unions have been for Trident and the constituents have been for Trident and therefore you an unequivocally party conference tells you, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, you've got to vote for the renewal of Trident. I think the, the what was mentioned fleetingly there, the beginning of the stacking of the NEC. Um, That's Labour's Jeremy, ruling executive. Yeah, Jeremy Corbyn wants to control Labour's ruling executive and it's a, I think it's a power he wants to control, it's a power which Unite want to control and it's It'll be a tussle between him and Tom Watson to a certain extent because the deputy leader traditionally is responsible for organisational matters. But all those issues about who selects the MPs, what we do about the Boundary Commission, the Boundary Review, all those things, are they going to be on Jeremy Corbyn's desk or Tom Watson's desk? I, for one, hope they'll be on Tom Watson's desk. Let's just go back into the hall briefly. Margaret Beckett, they're moving uh, a policy motion. Uh, you're saying, ah, did you say there? Uh, yeah. John McTernan, um, obviously a senior Labour figure of past governments, former Foreign Secretary, acting leader at one stage, deputy leader too. Mm. She also nominated, um, she also nominated uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And didn't vote for Jeremy Corbyn because, as she admitted afterwards, she was a moron. Um, because in the end, we're in this terrible situation as the Labour Party because a handful of people refused to actually take the responsibilities of MPs properly um, in an old-fashioned kind of way. It, you should only nominate people you're going to vote for. I don't normally nominate Tory candidates in local government elections because I'm going to vote for the Labour candidate. But what I suppose people like you um, have to remember also, John mm. McTernan, is that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell have a massive mandate. Um, you know, more new members to the Labour Party than perhaps you could have imagined in your wildest dreams. Um, Re-energising uh, parts of the population that hadn't been by Labour policy in the last five years or so, which will make it difficult for members of the Shadow Cabinet who don't agree with Jeremy Corbyn to actually do anything about it. Yeah, well, my view of that really is that the, the MPs in the Shadow Cabinet hold the views they hold because they spent uh, the, the most of the last 18 months out on the doorstep talking to real people who don't trust Labour on welfare, immigration or the economy. And they understand that the mandate we need is from the British people, not from Labour supporters. You cannot win a general election uh, on 500,000 people. And you've got to win it by winning it, not persuading people who voted Labour last time to vote Labour again. You've got to win it by persuading people who voted UKIP to vote Labour, people who voted Tory to vote Labour. And what's happening inside the Labour Party is a kind of discussion, discourse, which basically says only Tories can win elections because they win them from the centre. And when you say Labour has won elections under Wilson or Callaghan or Attlee, the implication is they must have been Tories too because only Tories can win elections. There's a kind of self-satisfaction about well, losing that's coming through. And you, you do get a mandate as leader, but your task as leader is to be a steward of the party. And if you take the party from 30% to 25% to 20% of the popular vote, you've lost your legitimacy. Do you think it's going to be more difficult for Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald to do the things they want to do? You said they're revolutionaries. Um, because the party machine, like on Trident, you know, will put obstacles in their way and that in the end they may have to compromise on all sorts of issues which will then be policy that you could support? I think it's very likely that what we saw um, over the Trident vote reflects a reality which is that actually the handful of policies that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell have held on to so tightly since the late 70s aren't actually as exciting to most people as they are to those two. So they may well get more problems with trying to impose them on the party, particularly on MPs and act active Labour parties and, uh, and trying to change the party that way. The difficulty is um, there's a, they've, they've, got, they've, they've got an ideology, they've got a proposition. Either you take it and run the party that way 
uh, in my view, you drive the party into a wall, or you compromise, and what you get is a kind of far less well-delivered version of what Ed Miliband was doing, which is we can split the difference between us and the electorate. We think the elect we think we can be a bit more left-wing than Labour's been before. The electorate may be in the centre, but we can split the difference. And with a right-wing Tory government, we'll get some people to us because they don't like the Tories. That's what Ed tried. It didn't work. And Ed Miliband and Ed Balls um, are senior figures, big figures. They were big cabinet ministers. We're now trying to do it from a further left point of view and say, well, having failed to triangulate with the public uh, and pull them left from a slightly left point of view, let's go further left because that's bolder. Um, and but it is distinctive, which is the it, criticism of the other leadership. Ah, I think we can now go back into the hall and listen to mm -hmm. the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, as he takes to the podium. Here he is. Thanks, comrades. Thank you. For those of you who know my normal speaking style, can I just give you this warning? This is not going to be my usual rant. And there's no jokes. They get me into trouble. <laughs> and I promised Jeremy I'd behave myself. Also, I have to say also, we've had some serious messages for the British people today as well. Jeremy and I sat down at the beginning of the campaign for the Labour leadership to discuss what they call the strap line for his campaign leaflets and posters. And we came up with the strap line you see now, straight talking, honest politics. It just embodied for me what Jeremy is all about. So in the spirit of straight talking and honest politics, here's some straight talking. At the heart of Jeremy's campaign, on which he was received such a huge mandate, was the rejection of austerity politics. But Well, you know, austerity is just a word almost meaningless to many people. What does it actually mean? Well, for Michael O'Sullivan, austerity was more than a word. Michael suffered from severe mental illness. He was certified by his GP as unable to work. But despite the evidence submitted by three doctors, he was assessed by the company given the contract for the work capability assessment as fit for work. Michael killed himself after his benefits were removed. The coroner concluded that his death was a direct result of the decision in his case. And I don't think Michael's case is alone. I'm grateful to Michael's family for allowing me to mention him today. And I send them, and I'm sure on behalf of us all here, our heartfelt sympathy and condolences. But, But I also want them to know that this party, when we return to government, we will end this brutal treatment of disabled people. <laughs> austerity, austerity is also not just a word for the 100,000 children in homeless families who tonight will be, well, who tonight will be going to bed, not in a home of their own, but in a bed and breakfast or temporary accommodation. On behalf of this party, I give those children my solemn promise. When we return to government, we will build you all a decent and secure home in which to live. <laughs> Austerity... Austerity is not just a word for the women and families across this country being hit hardest by cuts to public services. Women still face an average 19% pay gap at work. I tell you now, Labour will tackle the pay gap, will oppose the cuts to our public services, and we will end discrimination in our society. <laughs> whenever, whenever we cite examples of what austerity really means, the Conservatives always argue that no matter what the social cost, their austerity policies, they are necessary to rescue our economy. 
Let's be clear. Austerity is not an economic necessity. It's a political choice. <laughs> the leadership... The leadership of the Conservative Party made a conscious decision six years ago that the very richest would be protected and it wouldn't be those who caused the economic crisis who would pay for it. Although they said they were one nation Tories, they've demonstrated time and time again. They don't represent one nation, they represent the 1%, the 1%. When we, when we challenge their austerity programme, the Conservatives accuse us of being deficit deniers. Let me make this absolutely clear. Of course, we accept that there is a deficit, but we'll take no lessons from a Chancellor who promised to wipe out the deficit in one Parliament but didn't get through half, who promised, who promised to pay down the debt but has increased it by 50% or more. I tell you straight, from here on in, Labour will always ensure that this country within, lives within its means. But we will tackle the deficit. But it, this is the dividing line between Labour and Conservative. Unlike them, we will not tackle the deficit on the backs of the middle and low earners, and especially not by attacking the poorest in our society. We've always prided ourselves. We've always prided on ourselves on being a fair and compassionate people in this country, and we are. We will tackle the deficit fairly, and we can do it. And here's how. We will dynamically grow our economy. We will strategically invest in the key industries and sectors that will deliver the sustainable long-term economic growth that this country needs. Economic growth that will reach all sections, all regions and all nations of our country, and I mean it. I tell you now, I was devastated by the loss, labour losses in Scotland. But let's be clear. The SNP has now voted against the living wage, against capping rent levels, and just last week voted against fair taxes in Scotland to spend on schools. So here's my message to the people of Scotland. Labour is now the only anti-austerity party. And I tell you... For those... For those in Scotland who want to campaign against austerity, now is the time to come home. Come home to Labour. We will halt the Conservative tax cuts to the wealthy, paid for by cuts to families' income. As Margaret has said, three weeks ago we sat in Parliament and we saw one of the starkest examples of the difference between us and the Conservatives. The Conservatives cut tax credits to working families to pay for a multi-billion pound cut in inheritance tax. Families who have done everything asked of them, working hard but dependent on tax credits to make up for low pay. They'll have £1,300 taken from them to pay for the tax cuts to who? To the wealthiest 4% of our population. The Conservatives argued they'd introduce the living wage to make up for the tax credit cut. But we all know, as Margaret has said, it was neither a living wage nor, according to the IFS, IFS, did it make up for the amount families lost. I'll tell you now, when we return to office, we will introduce a real living wage to lift people out of poverty. <laughs> Labour's, Labour's plan to balance the books will be aggressive. We will force people like Starbucks, Vodafone, Amazon and Google and all the others to pay their share of taxes. Let me tell you also, let me tell you also, there will be cuts to tackle the deficit. But our cuts will not be to the number of police officers on our streets or nurses in our hospitals nor teachers in our classrooms. There'll be cuts to the corporate welfare system that's grown up. There will be cuts... There'll be cuts to the subsidies paid to companies that take the money and fail to deliver the jobs. 
There'll be cuts to the use of taxpayers' money subsidising poverty-paying bosses. And there'll be cuts to the billion pound tax breaks given to buy to let landlords for repairing their homes when they do not undertake the repairs. And we'll cut the housing benefit bill. Yes, we'll cut the housing benefit bill. And we'll do it by building the homes we'd need and controlling exorbitant rents. Where money, needs to be, where money needs to be raised, it will be raised from a fairer, more progressive taxation. If we inherit a deficit in 2020, fiscal policy will be used to pay down the debt and lower the deficit. But at a speed that does not put in jeopardy sustainable economic growth, we'll use active monetary policy to stimulate demand where necessary. But also now, we'll turn the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills into a powerful economic development department in charge of public investment, infrastructure planning, and yes, setting new standards at work for all employees. <laughs> this is a radical departure, not just from neoliberalism, but also from the way past administrations have tried to run our economy. Why? Well, to be frank, we just don't think the current model delivers. We don't think that destroying industries and then subsidizing low pay economy through a tax system is a good idea. But our radicalism comes with a burden and we have to acknowledge that. We need to prove to the British people we can run the economy better than the rich elite that runs it now. That's why that's why today I've established an economic advisory committee to advise us on the development and implementation of our economic strategy. We will draw upon the unchallengeable expertise of some of the world's leading economic thinkers, including Joseph Stiglitz, Professor Thomas Piketty, <laughs> Professor Mariana Matsukatu, Simon Red Lewis, Anne Pettifer, and the former member of the Bank of England Monetary Committee, David Blancheflower. And you know there are many, many others that have been drawn in now for their specialist knowledge as we create our economic policies. And I give you this undertaking. I give you this undertaking. Every policy we propose, every economic instrument we consider for use will be rigorously tested to its extreme before we introduce it in government. And we'll demand that the Office of Budget Responsibility and the Bank of England put their resources at our disposal to test and test and test again to demonstrate that our plans are workable and affordable. In, these bodies are paid for by taxpayers and therefore should be accessible to all parties that are represented in Parliament. In government, in government we will establish and abide that as a convention. The foundation stones of our economic policy are prosperity and social justice. We will create what Mariana Mazzucato describes as the entrepreneurial state, a strategic state which works in partnership with businesses, entrepreneurs and workers to stimulate growth. Government's role is to provide the opportunity for massive advances in technology, skills and organisational change that will drive up productivity, create new innovative projects and also new markets. That requires patient, long-term finance for investment in research from an effectively resourced and empowered national investment bank that we will create in government. <laughs> A successful and fair economy cannot be created without the full involvement of its workforce. That's why restoring trade union rights and extending them to ensure workers are involved in determining the future of their companies is critical to securing the skills and the development and innovation to compete in a globalised economy. But we'll also, 
will also promote modern, alternative, public, cooperative, worker controlled and genuinely mutual forms of ownership across our economy. I'll watch my language on this one. Look, I found that this, you know, at this stage, let me just say, I, I found the Conservatives' rant against Jeremy's proposal to bring rail back into public ownership absolutely ironic. When George Osborne was touring China, selling off to the Chinese State Bank any British asset he could lay his hands on. It seems, you know, it seems the state nationalising our assets is OK with the Tories as long as it's Chinese State Bank or, in the case of the railways, the Dutch or the French. Institutional change will follow and has to reflect our policy change. So I want us to stand back and review the major institutions that are charged with managing our economy to check that they're fit for purpose and how they can be made more effective. So as a start, I've invited Lord Bob Kersley, former head of the Civil Service, to bring together a team to review the operation of the Treasury itself. I'll also be setting up a... I thought that would go down well. <laughs> I'll also be setting up a review of the Bank of England. Let me be clear, we will guarantee independence, the independence of the Bank of England, but it's time though to open up the debate on the bank's mandate that was set by Parliament 18 years ago. The, main, the mandate focuses on inflation, and even then the bank regularly fails to meet its target. We will launch a debate on expanding that mandate to new, include new objectives, including growth, employment and earnings as well. We will we'll review the operation and resourcing of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to ensure that HMRC is capable of addressing tax evasion and avoidance and modernising our tax collection system. This, this is how we prepare for the future and the very day we go back into government. Let me just return now to today's economy and to because, to be frank, I'm, I'm fearful for the future. George Osborne fought the last election on the myth that the slowest economic recovery from recession in a century has been some sort of economic success. In reality, the Tories presided over the longest fall in workers' pay since Queen Victoria sat on the throne. A recovery that was based upon rising housing prices, growing consumer credit and inadequate reform of the financial sector. An imbalanced economy, overwhelming reliance on insecure jobs in the service sector. Our balance of payments deficit, it's the gap between the, what we earn from the rest of the world and what we pay to the rest of the world, is at its highest levels since rec modern records began. I worry, I just worry, that many of the pre-crash warning signs are reappearing again. But the UK's economy is recovery only despite the Chancellor's policies, not because of them. You know, you know the narrative that George Osborne wanted to present of us this week. Deficit deniers risking the security of the nation, all that. It was so obvious, all of us could have written it blindfolded. He's brought forward his grandiose fiscal charter, not as a serious policy making, but as a political stunt, a trap for us to fall into. I just say to George, we're not playing these games anymore. We're more interested in the long-term future of our economy than this political spin that he's developing. I want... I want... I want you and I want the rest of this country to know the significance of what we're doing today. We're embarking upon the immense task of changing the economic discourse in this country. Step by step, first, 
we're throwing off that ridiculous charge that we're deficit deniers. Second, we're saying tackling the deficit is important, but we're rejecting austerity as the means to do it. Third, we are, third, we are setting out an alternative based on dynamically growing our economy, ending the tax cuts for the rich, and addressing the scourge of tax evasion and tax avoidance. Fourth, just having cleared all that debris from our path, we're opening up a national discussion on the reality of the roles of deficit, surpluses, long-term investment, debt, and monetary policy. And we're involving the British people in this discussion. Fifth, we will develop a coherent, concrete alternative that grows a green, a sustainable, and prosperous economy for everybody and not just the few. We're, we're moving on the economic debate in this country from puerile knockabout to an adult conversation. I believe the British people are fed up with being patronised and talked down to by politicians with little more than silly slogans and misleading analogies. I tell you, this is an immense task. That's why we need to draw upon all the talents outside and inside the party. I admit I was disappointed after Jeremy's election that some people refused to serve. In the spirit of solidarity upon which our movement was founded, I say, come back and help us succeed. Come back. People, 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 people will be encouraged to express their views in constructive debate. Do not mistake debate for division. Do not mistake dis democracy for disunity. This is the new politics. Many still don't understand its potential. But as socialists, we will display our competence with compassion. We're idealists, yes. But our idealism is pragmatic idealism, to get things done, and above all else, to transform our society. We remain inspired by the belief and the hope. Now, yes, in the words of the slogan, another world is possible. This is our opportunity to prove it. Let's seize it. Solidarity. Well, there's the standing ovation for John McDonnell in what was broadly a fairly low-key speech, really. He started in fairly self-deprecating style, saying it wasn't going to be his usual rant. He admitted that those sorts of things got him into trouble and Jeremy had told him to behave himself. He then set out very clearly his and Jeremy Corbyn's alternative view to dealing with the economy and dealing with the deficit. He made a solemn pro promise to disabled people and to children in homeless families that he would do what he could to improve their lot in society, that they would tackle the deficit fairly. They weren't deficit deniers. There's Len McCluskey there, smiling, um, and Jeremy Corbyn with John McDonnell giving him his support. He moved on to Scotland, actually, fairly early on, said he was devastated by the losses in the general election in Scotland, but he made a clear appeal there to Labour voters that actually Labour was now, under Jeremy Corbyn and his leadership, the only anti-austerity party. Come home, he said to those Labour voters who voted you, for John. the SNP, people now sitting down. Um, the speech was about just over... 20 minutes long. We had some of it here in front of us. He also went on to talk about aggressive tax policies that he would put in place if he was Chancellor to force people like Starbucks and Vodafone to pay their share of taxes. But there wasn't too much in the way of radical language. He did towards the end also make an appeal to those MPs and others who refused to serve in a Jeremy Corbyn shadow cabinet to come back. He said he was disappointed that after Jeremy's election some refused to serve. So John McTurnan, as our guest, does that overture work for you? Will you go and help Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. 
I thought what was really interesting about that appeal was that it got the loudest clap from uh, the audience in the conference, suggesting that the conference would rather see Tristram or Chucka or Rachel or Chris Leslie delivering that speech than um, John McDonald. Um, and I'm not surprised it was a pretty dull speech. And what wasn't dull um, was just fantastical economic. It doesn't matter how much you consult on it. There are no giant corporate tax breaks to remove that don't attack investment. Uh, we don't want to attack tax breaks for investment if we want to grow the economy. There was a classic absence of any statement about how, we, how do we have a high growth, high productivity, high wage economy. It would be nice to have some detail. There's never any detail from, from Jeremy. You should but have had much his, more vision. But this was his opening gambit, if you like. This was him setting out his stall. I mean, are you saying there's no alternative vision to what has happened under the coalition and then the Conservative government now, that there isn't a different way of running the country and doing economics. I mean, he did make quite a virtue of those renowned economists that are now going to be part of his advisory uh, group uh, who are going to be talking to him about how he could put forward that economic vision and put it into practice. Sure. Anybody can get five economists to join a panel to sign a letter. I mean, as they say, if you laid all the economists in the world end to end, they still wouldn't come to a conclusion. Like, you can get an economist to support you for whatever you want to say. The problem at the heart of what he was saying there to us is you've got a picture of a British economy which ordinary voters won't recognise. That was miserabilism. That was, we live in a terrible country. We live in the fifth richest economy in the world and it is growing very, very fast. There was no mention there of the stark fact that between now and 2020, the number of self-employed people will, be, will grow to the extent that there'll be more self-employed people in Britain than there will be public sector workers. That's a moment to celebrate. It was also the key to productivity, to innovation, to growth. There was nothing there about the practical hard details, the hard work of how do you get higher well, wages. Well, and they will be asked about that. But what about issues like inequality, for example? Uh, what about, um, from some people's perspective, that there is this big divide? Mm. Um, not everyone has benefited from mm. the so-called recovery um, that the Tory government says it's presiding over. What about that section of the population? That's who he's talking to. Sure. I mean, the first thing to say is there is recovery. Uh, you can't be a recovery denier. It, there has been a recovery. There's been a huge boost in jobs. There's been a lag uh, in, in pay recovering. That pay is recovering too. I think to, dis to, to not address the fact that something has happened that's happening in the economy, uh, to not acknowledge that the Tories have delivered something, the coalition delivered something, renders your voice um, almost unheard by the public out there. You, can't, you can only attack your opponent if you concede what they've done. Something's been done. Has it, is it growth in the right way? No. Should it have been interrupted in the early years of the coalition? No, it shouldn't. But we do have growth. How do you turbocharge it? And the, the, the problem about, about Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, is they say, this is bad, I'm against, they, they're against inequality, they're against homelessness, um, they're against poverty, they're against... Uh, but then who isn't against but, poverty? Yeah, and that, but then, then when you say, then what you never hear is how they will tackle homelessness, how they will tackle, you get... But you don't do bold. that in a conference speech, do you? you you've, this was the chance to make a pitch to the public, to say, we heard what you said in May, that you did not believe the Labour Party could be trusted to run the economy. That was a speech to the party conference to say, we don't like the Tories. I mean, like, any viewer turning that on would not be surprised to find out that John McDonnell doesn't like the Tories. What they want to find out is, what is John McDonnell going to do for me, me and my family? And there's not, most people aren't going to go, oh, I'm one of those homeless people, or I'm one, this is, the problem with miserableism is most people in Britain are proud to live in the greatest country in the world. John McDonald does not believe Britain's the greatest country in the world. Who was he talking to in that speech? He was talking to he was talking to the people who selected him. He wasn't even speaking to, uh, in my view, wasn't even speaking to the whole of the conference hall. He was speaking to the people who were going to give him the desultory claps that they got off the clap lines. It was it was it was, um, I mean, it was barely a set of talking points, to be honest. I mean, in terms of reassurance, though, about what he might or might not do, he talked about the Bank of England, about mm. wanting to review its, its rebit. Um, I mean, is he going to worry people in the city, for example, in business with that speech? He's not, he doesn't want to review the Bank of England with a view to making it more independent. His intention is to make the Bank of England less independent. Mm. His view is he wants to review the mandate because he's concerned that we're not meeting the inflation target. And haven't met it for a very long time. Does, does, does he think that the job of a Labour Chancellor, if elected, 
is to ensure we get inflation. I mean, that's the question that goes, unbe that goes unanswered in all of this. You're reviewing the mandate to remove the independence. You're reviewing the mandate because you want to get more inflation. Well, talk through the consequences of what you're actually arguing for. Does he genuinely want this? Does he really have? Does he really think? I mean, this is the problem about the whole proposition. Does he really think that George Osborne could, if he tried harder, collect twenty billion pounds more of tax? Does he really think George Osborne is such a nasty Tory that he prefers to see people not paying tax and prefers to make cuts to public spending? If George Osborne could find £20 billion easily from it reviewing HMRC, he'd review HMRC, he'd get the money and he'd give it back to us in tax cuts. He's a Tory, he doesn't want tax cuts. He's not a Tory who's incompetent and doesn't want to collect taxes. Right, and he, of course, the, I mean, this speech was very much about his credibility, as he saw it. He, he wants to prove mm. to the British people that actually you can run the economy differently, <clears throat> but still competently. He said you could run it better than the rich elite, as he paints um, the Tory establishment. There will be many people, I put to you, who, who weren't in that hall, who even voted, who will think, well, actually, yes, I quite like the sound of that. To be honest, um, most people do not live in a world of raging class consciousness and fueled with anger at an elite. There, if but we people... have seen these big anti-establishment moves. We've seen it in Scotland. We've seen it with Jeremy Corbyn's election. There is a, a big anti-establishment move. Have, yeah. We've got to respect the facts and the views of the public. In May, they voted, 51% of them voted for UKIP, the DUP or the Tory party. They were not making a protest at an elite and inequality and demanding more left-wing policies. They were saying, we quite like the centre-right. I've been getting away with it all my life.